You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggles, stories, and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Past episodes of the Authentic Business Adventures program can be found on the podcast link at drawincustomers.com. We are coming to you from the Sun Prairie Community Radio Studios, underwritten by Bank of Sun Prairie. My name is James Kademan, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and helpful coach to small business owners across the country. Today, we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Victoria Luznaski, owner of Brilliant Speakers Academy. Victoria, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you for having me, James. Well, thanks for being on here. we got a lot going on in this world, and I was poking around on your website. You have some cool stuff going on. So how about for the listeners, we just start out and you just let us know, what is the Brilliant Speakers Academy? Well, Brilliant Speakers Academy is an online program for introverted entrepreneurs and business professionals who are afraid of public speaking. And so through that program, they can learn to overcome their fear and learn how to craft a compelling talk, uh, engage with their audience, be brilliant on stage or on video, on a live stream, and basically transform from somebody who is scared of public speaking to somebody who is a confident, compelling, and captivating speaker. Now that is interesting to me because you're talking about introverted speakers, which seems a little bit like an oxymoron. So it, it sounds like that. you must have some experience with this. I have firsthand experience with this, <laughs> actually, because myself, I am an introvert. I'm very much an introvert. I uh, I have a career in corporate. I've built several businesses over the years. And so I am pretty much an introverted business professional and entrepreneur. And I used to be absolutely terrified of public speaking. Just really? Just plain terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and so I understand people who say, you know what, I feel like public speaking is a talent. It cannot be learned because I know I don't have it. Why bother? I, I get those people because this is exactly how I felt. Um, you know, in my childhood, I was so introverted and so much afraid to speak up. You know, it was hard for me to speak even one-on-one. -on -one. So let's say growing up, I would, I would blush and, you know, I would lose my train of thought. Like I would, I would feel very uncomfortable. It's just, you know, being an introverted child. And uh, when I was about 10 years old, I, and I was growing up in the Soviet Union, by the way. Um, I moved okay. to the States um, about 25 years ago or so. But when I was about 10 years old, I was asked to recite a poem mm -hmm. uh, in front of an audience of about 1,000 people. And they just gave me that poem in the morning, and the concert was in the afternoon. And the poem was, I swear, like three pages long. And they said, okay, <laughs> just uh, you know, learn it by heart, and you go for it. And, you know, um, I mean, it's Soviet Union. You don't just go like, what? You just say, yes, thank you. I'll do it. And so I, 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 I did actually put a lot of effort, and I learned it. And I stepped in front of a microphone, and I'm all by myself on that big stage, and I'm looking into that, you know, dark audience. And I realize that I am so scared. Uh, my mind is completely blank. My, my legs are shaking. My heart is racing. I'm sweaty. I cannot recall a single line from that poem. And I'm standing there, shaking and staring. And the whole audience starts to giggle, of course. Sure. And I just run off stage in tears. And from that point on, you know, apart from being an introvert and not wanting to communicate too much anyway, now I'm really scared of public speaking, of microphones, of anything that has to do with stage. And I told myself I will never, ever do this. So... I was not growing up dreaming that one day I'll teach public speaking. I was growing up dreaming that I will never, ever have to be in front of a microphone. <laughs> so, but then, um, you know, when I moved to the U.S., I started my first business, which was a web development company. And, you know, back then, it was like late 90s. Back then, you didn't have the ability to hide behind your computer, you know, and do a live stream, do a podcast. Sure, sure. Um, you, you, you actually had, right, right? I mean, you had to go out there and build your business through actually speaking to people, yes. um, you know, giving presentations and all of that. You didn't have that luxury that every, every one of us has, has today. 
Well, I, I, I did. And, you know, everybody said, hey, you know, do it scared, right? So I'm like, okay, I'll just do it scared. And I did, and I was terrified, and I kept on practicing and practicing and doing it. And guess what? <laughs> I was huh. not getting any better. I was not oh, getting okay. any better. Whoever said practice make, makes it perfect, I don't think they were talking about somebody who's afraid of public speaking and trying to do it. <laughs> You're just because reinforcing the fear. <laughs> you are reinforcing the fear. Exactly. You're so right. And I bet you, you know, your listeners right now uh, totally can relate to this because, you know, when you are scared of public speaking, no matter, no matter how many times you go out there and you try to speak to your audience, the only thought in your mind is, are they judging me? What are they thinking of me? You're not sure. thinking about, you know, uh, you know, your audience or anything else. All you're thinking about is they're judging me. They're going mm-hmm. to find out I'm a fraud. They're going to find out I don't know anything. And mm. when you keep on going in front of your audience every time with that thought, or as I call it, approaching public speaking from a place of fear, mm-hmm. the truth is you're not going to get any better. You're going to continue feeling scared. You know, I've, I've actually spoken to people who have had a corporate career where they had to speak. I've talked to somebody who's been speaking for 10 years. Every month she had to give a presentation, and she said 10 years later, she's still terrified. She's very uncomfortable. She's better, but she still doesn't like it and does not feel confident in front of your audience, which is crazy. Interesting. All right. All right, so this so, yeah. remind me again what business this was that you started? A while it ago? was web web development. It was web, web development, development in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. In oh, the wow. late nineties where, you know, back then you had primarily static websites. Remember those HTML websites? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing. And I was offering my clients to build um more complex websites where they could make changes to their websites themselves without knowing any coding. So that was a lot of fun and it was a great business, but again, um, I had to go out there and speak. And so I had nothing to do with public speaking as far as, you know, being a professional speaker. I was just trying to build my business and expand my business. And so as a result of all of this struggling, I realized that I am doing it all wrong. And sure. then over the years, I've been, you know, correcting it and I've been figuring out what I was doing wrong. I was changing things. I was learning how to do it right. and you know, fast forward 10 years, I'm um, in the corporate, I'm delivering presentations all the time, I'm, you know, building another business on the side, and people come up to me after every presentation and say, oh my gosh, you're amazing, you're a natural. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm not a natural, trust me. The 10-year overnight success, on, right? I know, right? <laughs> but because it kept on happening, I was like, wait, I guess I've learned something because I know I overcame my fear completely. Because when you overcome your fear, when you're long, no longer afraid of your audience, it never comes back to you. You mm-hmm. never you never get to be scared of your audience ever again. You know, it's like the curtain goes up and it never goes down. You just you just know what to do and then you never even think about it. But I just realized that there are so many people who struggle with it just like I did, and they don't know how to turn this around. And that's where the Brilliant Speakers Academy really was born, where I started thinking, okay, let me deconstruct everything that I've done for myself. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't just read a book and then taught it, right? I actually had to walk that path for years and years and years that my students are walking. And so I pretty much just went back and I deconstructed everything that I had to do. How did I overcome the fear? How did I learn to create impactful, transformational talks? How did I learn to engage with my audience? And so doing all of that, you know, I I created basically a system, a big system of everything that my students need to know to overcome their fear, to become confident, compelling, and captivating speaker. And so that's when I packaged it all in the Brilliant Speakers Academy. So it's funny, you know, I'm teaching it now, but again, I was never growing up thinking that that's my lifelong aspiration is <laughs> to be a uh, public speaking coach. But that's sure. how it ended up happening. So tell me at what point, well, let's talk about your the website business. Did you close that up or did somebody buy it or how did you move away from that? 
I actually had to close it. I um, started in the late 90s. I moved to Colorado right around that time, and I really started building from, from ground up. It was very exciting, very wonderful. You know, I started getting publicity. I started getting to know people. I really started building it. And sure. then about four, three, four years later, the telecom bust happened. Oh. And the Colorado economy went completely and totally into, you know, a downspin. And it it was just really, really bad. My husband lost his job and we had to make a decision. He got an offer from Houston and we had to okay. make a decision whether to stay in Colorado where we come to Houston and we decided to come to Houston. But I just felt so overwhelmed to start again from ground zero because again, sure. it's not, it wasn't the type of a business you can bring over. You know, all my clients remained in Colorado. I had to leave. And so I, I just didn't do that, and I went back into corporate at that time. Okay. All right. So this is, you're talking about the dot-com crash, essentially, in the early 2000s. It was telecom. It was telecom, primarily. It was, telecom. Yeah, telecom was really big. Yeah, it was telecom was really big in Colorado in 2000, I think, 3, 2002, 2003 is when it was, uh, Colorado economy just had, like, I don't know, 20% unemployment. It was it was really, really, really bad at that time. And while the really? business was still going, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> All right. It was it was very interesting for anybody who was in IT at that time. And so so a lot of people had to close businesses. A lot of people had to downsize. A lot of people had to go out of state to look for jobs. And so that's, oh, wow. that's what we did. Of course, you know, I miss Colorado pretty badly. It, it was beautiful over there. But, you know, right. Houston is great. Houston is sure. wonderful. So, and you know, and I started back into corporate, in corporate, but I realized that I am an entrepreneur, and so I started another business in real estate. Um, I did some more work in corporate. Um, I worked in education for a little bit as a uh, as a manager of projects um, at uh, Department of Education here in Houston. Mm-hmm. And um, after that, I started my third business which I still own right now, and it's a okay. Nazi scientist of Houston, which is all about inspiring kids to fall in love with science. That was still before I had Brilliant Speakers Academy. So that, that's, that was my uh, brick and mortar as well as in school business. And I started, I started it about six years ago. It's a franchise. And I've built it from ground up, and I built it to be number one in the U.S. among all other Nazi scientist franchises. Wow. Um, and I still own it to this day, though, of course, as you can imagine, in today's world, it is not doing anything. <laughs> so <laughs> we're waiting to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> when you say today's world, you mean this whole corona thing going on, so the past That's few weeks or a couple of months, on. whatever. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's just a, yeah. a temporary blip in the scheme of things, considering how long you've had it. Yeah, and we kids aren't going so. away. We Science, so. we hope, isn't going away. No, STEM is not going away. Schools, hopefully, are not going away. Um, they've gone away <laughs> for a little while right now, and they're sure. not going to sure. reopen uh, through the end of the school year. And so, of course, our business is in school, so that's um, definitely a downside. Um, but sure. as you said, things will go back to normal at some point of time, yeah. and. Everybody understands the importance of science for kids, and so that's definitely the business that um, will continue going um, in some capacity, in some form, and of course, nobody knows what's going to happen past corona world, so we will see how it goes, but I'm just fortunate enough that several years ago, I also, in parallel, um, started, founded Brilliant Speakers Academy, and that I've been working with my students, and I continue working with my students, and continue enrolling students in the program. And as an online program, of course, it's not as affected by the economy as brick and mortar or school-related business. Sure. So having two businesses simultaneously actually turned out to be a blessing. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. I would say definitely. You know, it's it's weird yeah. because when I first started my business, I first started mine in 2006, first real business, mm-hmm. and I remember reading about serial entrepreneurs, 
and I thought, mm -hmm. who are these clowns that can't commit to one business? And then after you <laughs> run a business for a little while, you think, uh, I should probably start another one because you just get that bug or you find a problem that you want to solve. And so mm -hmm. you, you solve another problem, you start another business, and before you know it, you have a few of them. You have a focus issue now. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, I was such an idiot because I don't know of any entrepreneur that's been an entrepreneur for more than a few years that has not started more than one business. Like it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's rare that you start a business from scratch and not want to start another one. Just You're just always on the lookout for stuff, for problems to solve and all that jazz. So, yeah, it's that's interesting. That's so true. That, yeah, no, James, it's so true. And I think the reason is, is because, I mean, the whole reason why we are entrepreneurs and we're not working a full-time job working for somebody is because we do feel that drive inside mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. To... We have this, you know, we look for, we may not be, you know, looking for risks, but we right. embrace challenges, we embrace risks. We, we're looking for those, you know, interesting situations where we can actually go and show up in this world, you know, for who we, who we are. You know, I, right. I, I truly believe that all of us have a lot of gifts. And as entrepreneurs, we're just itching to share those gifts with the world, right? Sure, Whatever sure. those gifts are, we're looking for problems that our gifts can help solve. And mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, again, as soon as the business starts running sort of, you know, just without us really being involved that day to day, we get bored. And mm. that's what I felt with, you know, Nike Scientist after a few years. I, you know, the first few years were, of course, just really, really, really challenging and stressful because of working crazy hours because sure. I was working on the future of that business. Mm -hmm. I was putting systems in place. Sure. I didn't have to go and put those systems, but I knew I do not want to do the same things over and over. I do not want my, you know, my employees to do things over and over. I don't want to be dependent on, be employee dependent. I wanted to be mm -hmm. systems dependent. Yes. And Huge. so my first it's huge. My first few years, all I've been doing for Nazi scientists is putting systems in place, creating training videos, just doing all of those things. But then again, after a few years, when you have those things in place, all of a sudden you find yourself working fewer hours and you're like, okay, well, now I have time on my hands. What can I do now, right? That's sure. why we as entrepreneurs, we open new businesses because when you, when you, when your first business doesn't require you to be there, you know, 24 7, 8 hours a week. All of a sudden, you feel this itch that, oh my goodness, I have this extra five hours. What can I invest them in? I don't sure. know about you, but that's how I've always felt all my life. You know, even when I was working um, full time jobs, I was always looking to do things on the side. You know, I was teaching like back in mid 90s, late 90s, I was teaching software development in a computer school um, as a freelancer. Even though I was working full time job, even though I was at the time finishing my master's in computer science, I was also teaching as well. Just because it's always like this, this drive to do more, to express yourself more, to meet the challenges, to find challenges. I sure. Think that's what we entrepreneurs do, right? That's fair. I would definitely say so. Yeah, definitely yeah. say so. That's just uh, what we do. We look for problems and then we solve them. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's why it's yeah. such an odd time right now because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs are kind of be, they've been given the shaft a little bit, restaurant owners and stuff like that. Not necessarily by choice or anything. They just it's figured out, and that's what we do. So I just wrote a blog right. on that uh, this, this morning. Just mm -hmm. yeah, this too shall pass. So yeah. let's move on to the. Um, well, I guess let's let's talk about the science one business because that's intriguing to me. Did you? How did you find the need for that business? You know, I was at the time working uh, for Department of Education, um, not as an educator, but again, um, as a, I was overseeing all the software development projects as sure. a, a applications manager. So I was in that arena, but I wasn't really an educator myself. Um, I do have a lot of experience with education because, again, I've been teaching myself, not kids, but adults. 
And at the time, I also had very young kids of my own. And so kind of those things kind of came together as well as at that time, again, I felt that urgency to go and do something with my life. I was feeling complacent. I was feeling that I'm not, I'm not using my gift. I'm not using my brain even 50% of the time. And so I started looking for an opportunity to build another business. And I was, you know, looking at different things. Do I want to start something from ground up? Do I want to buy existing business? Sure. Do I want to buy a franchise? And franchise looked interesting to me because I'm not a scientist myself, for, for example, right? So I can't really write myself science classes. But I found the science franchise and I thought, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. It, it combines my passion for building something. It combines my passion for teaching kids. I love kids. I actually do love kids a lot. Um, it, it combines my passion for being in front of people because by that time I was already really, really good at public speaking. You know, being in front of people, I know I can go and I can be in front of people. I can promote this company. I can, I can go in front of, you know, schools, in front of parents, in front of all of those audiences. So I thought, okay, that seems like a good fit. But what really sealed the deal for me is, you know, being a franchise, they already had an international franchise, I should say. They already had a lot of things in place that I didn't need to reinvent the wheel. I could take existing classes and, you know, modify them for our market. But a lot of things were already there. So I could focus on my passion for building a business rather than the actual content. Sure. And so I... I did some more research, and I got that franchise, um, and I bought it for the Houston market, and I, I was still working for half a year when I already owned the franchise. It was not open yet, but I was setting the foundation. And for those of you, dear listeners, for anybody who is doing this, and I know a lot of people do, where you work a full-time job, and you have a side hustle. You're trying sure. to build a side business, or... You have a full-time job, and you dream of being an entrepreneur. You dream of building something from ground up, and there is so little time. Trust me, I've been in your shoes. I know exactly how it feels. And so what I was doing is I was, of course, working evenings. Of course, I was working weekends on my new business, trying to set it up to open and for me to quit my job. But what I was also doing is, for example, during lunch hour, you know, instead of going and chatting with, you know, coworkers and just hanging out in a restaurant with them or doing whatever, I would eat my meal in front of my computer within like three minutes, and then I would run downstairs, go to my parked car, and I would go into my car with my notes and my cell phone, and I would be making calls, cold calls. Oh, sure. To schools, to preschools. And that was spring. I was trying to find enough business for the summer where we can do science shows, where we can do camps, where we can do other activities so that I can open my company in the summer and immediately start bringing lots of revenue. Mm. And so I spent several weeks in my car every single lunch break for an hour or, you know, 50 minutes on the phone, cold calling, cold calling, cold calling. So for those of you who don't have time and, you know, just like you, I have a family, I have young kids, I have two kids, um, it's very challenging, but it's very sure. doable. And, and, the, and the thing is that I think what I want to encourage everybody is just, you know, do little things, set little goals, don't go crazy. It's, you're going to overwhelm yourself and you're going to feel like, okay, it's not possible and you're going to give up on your dream to open a business. Mm -hmm. You you have to set little goals. You have to set little you know little chunks of activities. Like my my goal wasn't even to close X number of deals. My goal was make X number of calls. That's all I was going for. So just but monitor the activity, the stuff you can control, because you can't control a yes or a no, but you can control whether you make the call or not. Whether you make the call or not, you're so right. This is such a good such a good way of putting it. You can, you, you can only control certain things, certain things you cannot control. So you focus and you set your goals around things you can control, which is number of calls you need to make, number mm -hmm. of meetings you need to set up, number of companies you need to research. Um, everything that I've, did, I've done, I've done during that time while I was still working. You know, I would take my lunch hour and I would go and meet with a potential, par potential partner 
that can help me get into more schools. Sure. So all of that was I was still doing while working, and then um, by the time I was ready to open my business, truly open it, uh, which was June first, I quit the job just the week before that, and I already had camps lined up. I had about 50 science shows lined up. So I had real revenue already coming in, already hired instructors, already you know interviewed everybody, trained everybody. I was all good to go. And I just quit my job a week before I started, which truly you know, opened the business. Sure. So it is definitely doable. And so for anybody out there, don't be discouraged. It may take a long time. But as long as you continue, you know, making those little steps towards building your business on the side, towards, you know, opening or, you know, continuing building your business on the side. Sure. This is definitely doable. Just the perseverance. Just perseverance. Mm -hmm. So that business came about, the science business came about before the Brilliant Speakers Academy. Is that correct? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, So then, um, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so it's been um, about Business Academy has been around for about a year and a half. Okay. Two years. Yeah, and my science business has been around for six years. Gotcha. Okay. So, what made you want to tackle the whole introverted speakers thing? How did you know there was you a know, market, and how did you know that market would be interested? You know, like the whole the typical entrepreneur questions, right? I'm going to start this. Is there an, actually an audience, mm-hmm. and is that audience willing to pay for this? How did you figure stuff like that out? Yes. Yeah, so I, again, I was as I said, about three years into, into my Nike Scientist business. I started getting this itch that, okay, I have a little bit of extra time. I have so much more I can do. What else can I do? And at that time, I was doing presentations nonstop. Um, um, you know, I just, in the corporate world, I was doing them nonstop. And as I said, people were coming up to me saying that, oh, my goodness, you're amazing. But then I started doing them in front of, um, you know, in front of school administrators, in front of librarians. And every time people come up and say, I wish I could speak like you. I wish I could be that relaxed and in control in front of an audience. And this is really what started me thinking, wait, I know something that other people compliment me on. Sure. I know something that other people seem to want. Maybe me knowing public speaking or knowing how, not even knowing how to do public speaking. A lot of people know how to do public speaking. What I knew was how to overcome the fear Mm. while you're an introvert. I realized that what I have is a niche that not a lot of people speak about. So I started doing my research just to see, okay, who is talking about overcoming fear? And I realized not a lot of people talk about it. There are tons of programs on public speaking where they put, you know, a cart in front of a horse, as I call it. Those programs are geared either towards extroverts who are completely not afraid of public speaking, who can just go and talk in front of any crowd, and they teach them how to become a paid public speaker, you know, how to build a public speaking business. Sure. Or there are programs that teach you, you know, how to craft your talk or how to walk and talk and get rid of, you know, feel the words, like all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. which is stuff that you should still learn but is not going to help you if you oh, are Sure, <laughs> sure if you're terrified speaking. to get on the stage, it doesn't matter if you're going to use filler words. You're not exactly. even getting on the stage. You're not getting that far. Exactly. And so a lot of people, you know, they would go and take those courses and they're still not doing anything with that sure, knowledge that's because fair. they're still that's afraid. Totally and so I realized that that's, that journey that I had, the journey of going, taking years to go from somebody who is completely terrified to somebody who is completely comfortable at ease and not just is not afraid of an audience, but is looking forward to being in the spotlight, to mm. actually enjoying the spotlight. Sure. I knew that if I was able to make this journey, I should be able to teach other people how to make exactly the same journey. So as I was doing research, I realized, okay, there are not a lot of people who teach how to overcome your fear. And if I can teach people how to overcome your fear and then teach everything else, like how to craft a compelling talk, how to prepare 
for a presentation, you know, how to put a system in place mm-hmm. to prepare for any presentation, how to put a system in place where you're prepared for any, any, any what if scenarios, like what if this happens, what if that happens. When, you know, when I can teach people how to go on stage or in front of a camera and shine, that would be a really, really solid program that people would be interested in. So then I started doing market research. Then I started asking people. I was literally going into Facebook groups and asking people, okay, is it something you're interested in? So that was my like first step. <laughs> just to mm-hmm. see, just to get, you know, just to get yes or no type of a thing. Or people, you know, I was afraid people will be saying, nah, who needs it when nobody's afraid of public speaking anyway? And of course, everybody's <laughs> like, Not oh true. no, I'm terrified. I would love that. Which sure. of course, you know, it's a great first step research. Sure. But you still don't know whether that's going to work or not because you still don't know in depth will people be really willing. So then I did the next step. Next in depth step was to schedule interviews uh, with people and I promised to help them, you know, give them some pointers, you know, do 20 minutes on the phone where I can coach them a little bit, but in return, I can ask them questions about what they need the most, why, what, why they feel they need to overcome their fear, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, all of those questions that you need to know. What, mm-hmm. How would it help you? What your life would look like if you did overcome your fear? What your life would look like if you didn't overcome your fear? Mm. And so I did those interviews with a few, quite a few people. And what I also did, I I didn't record them. I didn't feel, I don't know, it wasn't even just me. I just kind of didn't feel it was ethical to record over the phone. But what sure. I was doing, I was doing um, a lot of notes like literally writing down exactly what they're saying. I was picking up their language. Like they were saying, you know, I am, um, if I overcome my fear, I will be able to go and share my message and it's so important to me. Or if I don't overcome my fear, um, my business will never grow. I was literally picking up what they're saying sure. so that I could use that language in my promotional material so that I can ah, speak gotcha. the language of my potential clients. Sure. Um, and so after I did all of those interviews, I had a really good idea of what people are looking for, what they want. Um, and then I started building the program. I, you know, spent a long, a long, a long time sort of interviewing myself, you know, deconstructing everything that I've done, trying to, and I'm very much left brain, James, honestly. I mean, you can probably tell. I mean, I'm, there is a reason why I've been uh, in IT for years and I have math in computer science. I'm left brain. I can build a system. Okay. I'm, I think in systems. And so I didn't just want it to be, you know, wish a washer and, uh, yeah, you know, some beautiful words of wisdom and then you overcome your fear. No, I wanted to give really, truly a framework to people that they can follow. Um, and so I've built that program. I've built an online program, um, and the next step was to test run it to see if it really mm. works. Sure. And so I have offered it to some people that I interviewed during my interview process. I offered it to some people I knew who struggled with public speaking. I offered it to some of the people on my list who I already had on my list by that time. And I had... I limited the group to 10 students, and I had very specific requirements that they need to be introverted, that I wanted them to be entrepreneurs, because at that time, I was targeting entrepreneurs like myself, specifically. Sure. And I ran a beta test. I ran through the whole program with my beta students, and we've gone through module one, through module seven, together as a group. And the results were great. The oh. results were terrific. Students have gone through that program, and in eight weeks, you know, students were saying, I, I, I'm, I'm no longer hiding from opportunities. I'm now actively looking for opportunities to speak. I had students who said, I know now exactly how to go in front of an audience, what I need to say, and I'm not afraid. I had students who were still in the program, you know, as they were going through the program, they were already saying, oh, my goodness, I'm on module three. Sure. And I have this major breakthrough where I understand why I was scared and I understand why I won't be scared anymore. Mm. So that that was amazing. And so recommendation I have for anybody, of course, we've all heard of beta testing, but if you can do it, 
definitely do it because it's so much worth it. You not only prove that your system works, because, of course, there is always a doubt in the back of your mind, well, I know it worked for me, but will it work for my students? And then you prove that that system that you build work for anybody because I had sure. people from different countries. I had different from different from you know people from different um, educational background, economic background, and it worked. And so that's when I knew that I can offer this program to general public. That I can start offering it to the world, and I've been helping students ever since. Nice. That is super cool. So you, it sounds like for something like this. There's a lot of time initially invested, and then after that point, it's either maintenance or marketing is what it comes down to. Is that correct? In a way, yes. Um, and under maintenance, I would also say maintenance uh, as a twofold. Um, maintenance as maintaining the system because you always want to improve it. Or at least I'm a perfectionist, um, which is not a good thing. <laughs> but well, I'm yeah, it's pro and con, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you, there is a there is a, an extent of when it's a good thing and then beyond that it becomes a bad thing because perfectionism stops you in your tracks, right? And you sure. keep on perfecting something instead of um, showing the world what you've done. Um, right. And that was my problem for the longest time. I've actually, I was actually been perfecting it for way too long before I was ready to say, okay, beta test. I was perfecting and perfecting for way too long. But, sure. But at the same time, so the maintenance is – making your system better. Because as students start going through it, you may get something where you're like, oh, maybe I wasn't quite as clear. Let me add another maybe handout to help my students through this. Sure. Um, so that's one aspect of it, where you're updating the system all the time. And you know, with my students, um, everybody does it differently. But with my students, my system, my students have lifetime access, which means uh, if I roll out version number two of Brilliant Speakers Academy, they will all have it. Right, the, right away. It's, I'm not going to sure. charge them for it. It's just going to be their system. So I'm making changes, and that's maintenance. But the second part of it is maintaining your current students, you know, mm -hmm. helping them through the program. Because I do not believe in um, self-study courses all that much. Okay. And the reason I don't believe in them is because I am myself very much invested in my own self-development and learning. I'm crazy about learning. I'm constantly investing in courses, into all kinds of programs, because I want to become better. I want to be smarter. Um, and, and I believe in this. I truly do. But from my experience, when you have a self-study course, you either get complacent with it, you know, you, you, <laughs> you do week one, and then you're like, I'll do it later. Sure. And you never come back to it. Um, yeah. Case in point, you know, right now during this time, Corona time, there are a lot of universities who release their free courses. And I'm taking a free course by um, UPenn, and I was all gung ho about it. And it's a self study course, right? So I'm all gung ho. Uh -huh. I've done the first week. And then I'm like, it's a great course. I'm going to get back to it. And it's been now a week and a half, and I haven't touched it. So I know the <laughs> self study courses. <laughs> No matter how excited you are, very often students put them aside because, you know, they're not, they just forget all about it. Some of them sure. never start on it, even though they spend the money. Some of them start on it and they, you know, really committed, but then they run into an issue and they roadblock and they cannot continue. So I'm a big believer into that, that you have to help them as a course creator, as a program creator, you have to be their coach, you have to be their mentor. And so the Brilliant Speakers Academy always came with a bonus of a free Facebook group where I am every day supporting my students, and I'm doing weekly Q&As there every single week, again, with the purpose of supporting my students. I'm sending them emails every single week, just my group, my students, supporting them, giving them words of encouragement, reminding them why they're doing it, and reminding them that I'm there to help. Because the truth is, if you are a program creator, if you are a course creator, you have to remember that the reason we, we, we do it is because we want to see the results, right? We want mm -hmm. our students to get results. We're not doing it purely to sell our course and make money. If that's your reason, then I don't believe you're truly, you know, you're true. Heart right, you probably wouldn't have that much to offer anyways, 
Because you wouldn't have the passion you know, to really get the people interested. Right. Absolutely. You know, yes, of course we are entrepreneurs because we want to make money. But it's not all. We want, I want to see every one of my students out there without right. fear, with confidence, mm-hmm. with passion, with love, talking to their audience. And it just, it, you know, it melts my heart every week. I actually prompt in the Facebook group, I prompt my students to say, hey, what did you guys do this week to step out of your comfort zone? Or what did you guys do this week mm. to get a little win? And sure. so they're posting things every week. And so every week I'm reading their post and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, somebody is three weeks, two weeks in the course and they're like, I just did a live stream and I never in a million years thought that I'll be able to do it and I just did it and I got so many comments and, you know, people love it. If they were doing a self-study course, they may have given up. But with me, they are constantly helping them. And, you know, if they have a question, you get stuck, you have a question, your course creator is there to help you. So if mm-hmm. you are in the same line of business as me, if you are a course creator, if you are a product developer, you, it, it's mandatory to have true support, not just, you know, lip service support, but true support where you care about your students and you right. help them through whatever framework you've created and my framework is a Facebook group which is you know it's very easy to implement and it's very easy to maintain it takes my time but it doesn't take you know a crazy amount of my time but sure. my students feel heard they feel supported they feel coached because I coach them with any chance I get and if they have a question you know then they have a question that's not even in line with my expertise um, I've had a question, um, somebody said, hey, I love the way you created your videos for Brilliant Speakers Academy. You know, I, I, I do slides with me on camera. It's very seamless and it's really, really beautifully professionally done. And I've done it myself. Um, and so they're asking me, how did you do it? Can you, can you tell us? Which mm-hmm. is not public speaking at all. You know, I really, it's not even a question. Right. No, it's <laughs> program creation. <laughs> But I'm, I'm like, I'm happy to do it. So I, I spent half an hour and I recorded a, a live stream where I recorded my computer and I walked them through, you know, the graphic system I've used, the video system I've used. I walked them through my, you know, video setup, how I recorded videos, microphone, everything. Spent half an hour, recorded this. It's half an hour of my time. I don't mind. But now it's in the Facebook group. My mm-hmm. students have access to it. They are thrilled. So many people already said, oh, my gosh, I'm going to now take your system of creating videos. I'm going to implement it. It's wins that, you know, that you can create for your students when you show up, when you really care. Absolutely. Oh, huge, huge. And, and especially in times like right now, again, right now. <laughs> Some challenging times, yeah. Challenging times, challenging times. You do want to show up more. And not mm-hmm. less. And it's harder to show up more. Um, as we, you know, as we laughed before we started this uh, interview, I'm in my car, guys. I am in my car. My car is running. <laughs> I'm in my car on the phone in the driveway because I cannot do this from home. It's too loud. My husband is working from home. My kids are doing homeschool from home to their school, and my dogs are barking. Sure. And I had to escape to the car, but. You feel, no matter how challenging, no matter how hard it is, you have to go and show up for your clients. You have to show up for your students. You have to show up for your potential clients. You have to show up for your audience. You just have to go and show up in this time because there are going to be a lot of people who will disappear when times are hard. Not mm-hmm. because they disappear, they can no longer do business, but because they just they just don't want to do the hard stuff. They just don't want to go and be in front. But you know, not, it, you. not you. Not yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's, interest, it's interesting that you say that because I was just joking with an office mate that um, I keep seeing a lot of people talking about what to, what to watch on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, that they want to just sit on the couch during this time now that they have a bunch of extra time and just binge watch and just be a couch potato kind of thing. I'm like, isn't everybody concerned about their health? Shouldn't they be doing something <laughs> healthful? <laughs> like go for a run, a bike ride, a hike, something like that where you can kind of keep moving or improve your business in some way, shape, or form or do something other than just sitting on the couch watching TV endlessly. 
Absolutely. No, you know, they my, personal rule, <laughs> my personal rule, and I'm just blessed that I have elliptical at home. I, you know, I've had it for, I don't know, 10 years probably, but it's really sure. awesome elliptical. I have it in the living room in front of a TV. And my personal rule, if I want to watch anything, and I don't watch TV, I just do, you know, Netflix or movies. But sure. if I want to watch anything, I have to jump on elliptical. It's like my TV is powered from elliptical. I have nah, to elliptical. you got to be moving. I'm no nah. elliptical. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't watch TV anymore, then I turn off the TV. It's, it's you know, one of those things. You have to set the rules. You have to set, um, you, and, and you're so right about this time being the time when watching Netflix is not the way to go. If you're no. wasting right now your time when you actually do have extra time, and I've been, you know, I've been talking to my students for the last two weeks. Both of my live streams have been about this. Look, guys, right now we all have extra time. Because mm-hmm. we don't have to commute to work or to our business. You know, things are closed. We don't go to the store. We don't meet friends. We have an extra hour at least. Every sure. single person out there, except for doctors maybe, has an extra hour. And right. why don't you take that extra hour and invest in yourself? Go and pick up that course that you bought three years ago and you never took. Go take that, you know, free live stream. Go listen to that free live stream. Go listen to podcasts. But mm-hmm. invest in yourself. Take this mm-hmm. time to come out stronger on the other side. Ask yourself every day, what can I do today that I don't regret wasting my time? What right. can I do today so that when this thing is over and I look back, I say, you know what? I did everything I could to get myself to the other side. Right. That's exactly, that's perfect. That's perfect. I love that, that you can feel proud and you can see some results instead of like saying, well, at least I knocked out that show. I watched every single episode or something like that. <laughs> what did that accomplish? That is not an achievement, guys. That is not an achievement. And you no. Will you really will. You really no, will I don't want to say that there's, that there's not a time and a place for chill time, but I do not believe that that time is until this blows over, right? For the next month or two or whatever, however long it takes for people to get bored. Um, that they just sit on the couch that whole time seems like a terrible waste to me. Just of intellectual talent, right? Like I feel that there's an obligation that people have to do something with themselves, to contribute to society as a whole. Absolutely. I, I cannot agree with this more. So true. Particularly, particularly if you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, well, I, for a lot of people, it's probably a must, right? Whether they, yeah. um, I was just, I was having a conversation with a guy about, um, I said, I feel so bad for the restaurant owners because I feel like they've been dealt a terrible hand here. They already got it pretty tough. Um, let's talk before all this Corona stuff happened. They were having a rough time with employees because employee, I don't know by Houston where you're at, what in, what the unemployment rate was, but by us is crazy low. And employees knew that. So a lot of times I said it was kind of funny, right? It's like they raised prices so that the employees were more expensive, but the quality of the employee went down because employees may or may not show up and they may or may not do the job. It's just typical employee stuff. Yeah. I'm like, they've been dealing with that. And then all of a sudden, almost overnight, the government's like, hey, um, you can't be open. <laughs> yeah. Funny story. Sorry about your it livelihood. Is, it- it is very scary, and and I am I I am literally experiencing this with my business right now. I mean, I have brick and mortar sure. that's been closed for three weeks now, completely closed because wow. we cannot we cannot have kids in our place right now. Well, I mean, right now we're staying in place anyway, but we couldn't right. even back then because everybody knew. Corona is contagious. And so all the birthday parties, all the camps, everything got canceled. Every sure. single one of our shows got canceled for spring break. Um, we we had we, we completely had to close everything. You know, schools are closed. We cannot do after school programs. We have, at the moment, we have zero revenue coming. Zero, oh. and it's going to be zero for, for, for the foreseeable future. So I am one of those businesses that totally gets it, that mm-hmm. right now is a bad time. It's a bad time, mm-hmm. and I, you know, my employees work part time, and so they only get paid when they work. So they, you know, I don't have the employee expense, but I still have the office space and everything. So it's, 
it's definitely challenging. It's unpredictable. Who could have thought that schools could be closed? I mean, I felt my business was recession proof because I have heard closed. that so many times <laughs> from uh I've heard it on both ends, right? Recently and in the past and I was like, mm. recession is just overall, sure. But pandemic or earthquake or insert problem here, I doubt that there's any business that is re- that um is every single problem proof like there's yeah. there's bound to be something i always joke with people like what if oprah came on tv and said the industry that you're in is terrible don't ever use it like, oh my god that would be the end of it <laughs> right and then just vice versa right what if oprah came on and said oh my gosh this business that you're in this industry that's the best go throw your money at them but all of a sudden you have the opposite problem right where you get two going on <laughs> it's just interesting how everyone i shouldn't say everyone a lot of people have this perception that there's no way that their business could fail. And I think deep down in the back of their head, that's a hope, certainly a hope, because you don't want to build a business that could fail at the the slightest issue because there's always going to be problems. But on the other hand, it's all but impossible to make a business that can withstand anything. So it's a, it's a challenging time. I feel so yeah, and- bad for so many business owners that just, I feel like they got a two by four to the head. Yeah. So and it, it's yeah. not stopping <laughs> for any <laughs> foreseeable future. So, yeah. but I guess and that you know, said, you gotta you gotta see the people. What are they doing at this point now? Like, are they just sulking, or are they figuring out a different way? I mean, there's. I can tell you from my own experience. Uh, you know, when you cannot do anything, you cannot do anything. Obviously, in my case, my business is not um, that my. I mean, I mean, my brick and mortar or in school business is not the kind of business I can take online. There is just really no way for me to take that online. We provide materials sure. for the kids. It's hands-on. But I'm looking at my um, neighbors in, in, in the um, office space where, which, I, which I live on the strip. Um, I'm mm-hmm. looking at my neighbors, and they're trying. Everybody's trying. You know, take one bill owner is trying to do the classes online and actually talk to him and, you know, gave him some pointers and some advice on what he can do online, how he can make his classes more personal, give parents sure. personal feedback to warrant those monthly payments that he's mm. still getting from the families. You know, we have Kumon next to me, which is tutoring business, um, art supplies. It's, it's just, there are all of these businesses, everybody's trying, everybody's trying to do something, but reality is I don't think any of us have ever been exposed to a um, situation, terrible no. situation that we are experiencing right. now. When, whenever I imagine right. that we, you know, we in Houston, we are exposed to business closing and all of that stuff because of hurricanes. I mean, sure. we live through so many hurricanes here. We don't even, I don't want to say we don't care, we care. But we, it's like, you know, one <laughs> of those things day. that just happened. Oh, hurricane in the Gulf. Okay. You know, sure. you you like business may close for a little bit, but never we experienced anything at the level and extent that we're experiencing now. It's all brand new ground for all of us. And so the only you know, words of wisdom that I can give is try your best to look at your business from every angle and see if there is anything at all you can do with it. If there is mm. anything at all you can do with it. And that's when I feel like diversifying your offerings, diversifying your business or businesses yes. Yes. is a good advice. And in my case, again, I have as my second, I, there is nothing I can do with my first business, no matter what I do, unless schools open, there is nothing we can do. But sure. I feel that my other business, on the other hand, can withstand this situation because my Brilliant Speakers Academy is entirely online and I have students all over the world and mm-hmm. it's it's still working. So sure. you try to figure out maybe right now is the time how you can make maybe take your current business online if there is any way to take it online. Right. I can see your Brilliant right. Speakers Academy doing well now since there's a bunch of introverts that are essentially in their cozy place now <laughs> they're told to stay inside they're like yes <laughs> now is our time to shine but they know that eventually this time is going to pass and they're going to have to get on that stage and and maybe yeah. the brilliant speakers academy is just what they're looking for just what they need yes i just had several students enroll yesterday i was running a, a master class and several new students enrolled everybody is unfortunately forced right now to be exposed 
Um, sure. You know, if before you could just get away with like a little meeting with one of your coworkers, for example, right now you have to go on Zoom and you may be in front of the whole department. <laughs> so everybody is exposed all of a sudden. Sure. Um, or Funny. as a business, you didn't ever have to, you know, maybe interact with your customers face to face. And now all of a sudden you have to go live right. and you have to go face to face and talk to your customers <laughs> as an owner. And so a lot of people now have a need for learning public speaking skills and if they're afraid they're in a lot of trouble and so um, of course yes with Brilliant Speakers Academy I can see how I can help a lot more people now sure. and I am uh, offering a lot more free training a lot more free things that can help my audience and and of course those who want to work with me directly then they enroll in the Brilliant Speakers Academy sure that's awesome well Victoria we got to wrap this up where can people find you online or at my website, which is okay. www.brilliantspeakersacademy.com or www.byvictoriael.com. Byvictoriael.com or brilliantspeakersacademy.com. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Victoria, for being on the show. I appreciate you coming on, even if, you had, <laughs> <laughs> even if you had to sit even in your car to do it to get some quiet. Yeah, you know, with technology, we can... We don't even have to wear clothes to be talking with people with stuff like this. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, James, James, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. And good luck to everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land, coming to you from the Sun Prairie Community Studios and a car, underwritten by Bank of Sun Prairie. If you are listening to this on the web, please like, subscribe, and share. My name is James Kateman, and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and receptionist services for small businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com, as well as Draw in Customers Business Coaching, offering business coaching services for entrepreneurs in all stages of their business on the web at drawincustomers.com. And of course, The Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur and all of us, available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Victoria Luznaski, owner of Brilliant Speakers Academy. Victoria, thank you again. This has been super awesome. Thank you so much. I feel like you have a lot to share, and I feel like there's a lot of introverts there that could that could use your services now. So this is super cool. <laughs> thank you. Find us airing on 103.5 Wednesdays at 1 p.m., Sundays at 2 p.m., as well as at sunprayemediacenter.com. Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night at the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business.